kidney stone is nothing more than a complex collection of crystals. And I think the best analogy to it is if you ever played with rock candy when you were a child, that a rock candy is generated by taking a solution of water, it gets oversaturated with sugar crystals, and then you put a string or a stick in that solution, which serves as a point of attachment for those crystals. The crystals begin to attach to the stone or the string. Once you have some crystals on it, more crystals then attach and it grows in that way. So a kidney stone is the exact same thing. It's a large collection of crystals that have attached to one another. And they occur because the urinary environment has become what we call supersaturated, which essentially means over-concentrated with the crystals that form stones. There are a wide variety of crystals that we see that can form stones. In the United States, most of the crystals that we see are called calcium oxalate or calcium-based crystals. And so for that reason, most of the stones that we see are calcium-based stones. Most of the time when we think of a kidney stone, we think of an event that we've heard about or a family member has experienced that involved a trip to the emergency room, oftentimes in the middle of the night, at an inconvenient time, on the 4th of July, on New Year's Eve. But many times, kidney stones don't cause those types of symptoms and that kind of pain. And in other cases, we can see kidney stones causing things like urinary tract infections or blood in the urine, and that may be how we learn of the presence of the kidney stone. There are other patients that have what we call quiescent kidney stones or asymptomatic kidney stones. And these are stones that are causing no symptoms whatsoever, but they're identified by accident or incidentally on a CT scan or x-ray performed for some other reason entirely. Kidney stones are what we call multifactorial, means that there are many factors that cause a kidney stone to form. And these factors are broad. Some of them we have control over, some of them we don't. Meaning that in some cases there's a genetic predisposition towards forming a kidney stone. For example, if you have a first degree relative, mother, father, sister, brother, that has a kidney stone, you're at higher risk than the average person walking down the street to develop a kidney stone. There are other risk factors though that we can control. And these are risk factors such as obesity, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, they're all associated with a diagnosis of a kidney stone. And there are other factors too, such as dietary factors, that can influence our risk for a kidney stone. So from a dietary standpoint, things like high sodium diets, low calcium diets, diets rich in certain types of foods called oxalates, all of those are going to put patients at increased risk for stone disease. Because stones are multifactorial, not all patients are going to have every single one of these factors that we just mentioned. Some of them may just have one or one or two. And part of the process that we take when we evaluate our patients with kidney stones is to identify which pathway they're taking to form the stones. We can best identify what maneuvers we can do, whether it's diet changes, medications, or other things that can reduce their risk. We don't want to do 10 or 12 different things if eight or 10 of those aren't even necessary and there's only really one or two reasons by which the patient's forming their stones. So we take a, a very personalized approach to identifying those risk factors and then trying to modify them. Kidney stones can be diagnosed in several different ways. In some cases, the patient identifies symptoms that are very consistent with a kidney stone and they may have had a kidney stone in the past, so the symptoms are very familiar to them. And they may contact us saying, hey, I had kidney stones previously. I'm feeling symptoms that feel very similar to what I felt years ago when I had a kidney stone. And so the patient actually is beginning the diagnostic process themselves. In other cases though, the patient may present to their physician, whether it be their primary care physician or a urologist, with complaints that aren't directly uh, attributable to the kidney stone, but they begin a process by which the stone is identified. So these are a patient who may have recurrent urinary tract infection or who may have blood in the urine and that complaint generates a investigation process that includes imaging studies such as x-rays or ultrasounds or CT scans which then diagnose the kidney stone. We try to tailor the treatment of stones to the patient in their specific situation. So in some cases we may diagnose a kidney stone in the patient and tell that patient that they actually don't need to have any treatment at all. The stone is not causing them symptoms and it's not a threat at all to the health of the kidney or to their renal function. And in those cases, we take what we call a surveillance approach, meaning we monitor the patient periodically with imaging studies such as ultrasound 
and we see the patient periodically in the office for evaluation, but we don't undertake a surgical treatment. There are other cases, though, where we do surgically treat stones, and those are typically cases where the stone may be causing symptoms or the stone may be doing something that we think is going to harm the function of the kidney over time. And in that case, we tailor the treatment to the situation. And so in some cases, we can treat the stone through a procedure called shockwave lithotripsy. And what that is, is a non-invasive treatment, meaning nothing is going inside of the patient. We're using sound waves or shock waves, which are generated from a device outside of the patient, similar to an ultrasound machine. That device is put up against the patient's side and we focus those shock waves onto the stone, deliver typically several thousand shock waves to the stone. The cumulative effect of those shock waves is they'll break the stone into smaller and smaller pieces till eventually they're the size of grains of sand and they can pass from the kidney almost asymptomatically without causing pain. In other cases though, we may have to take a little bit more invasive approach for the treatment of the stone. And so this would be procedures such as ureteroscopy. So this is an endoscopic procedure. So there's still no incisions that the patient's subjected to. But what we do is we pass a small camera through the urethra into the bladder, and then pass that small camera up the ureter, which is the tube that connects the kidney to the bladder. And we pass that small camera into the kidney to where the stone is. And we typically then use a laser to break the stone into small pieces, and then we remove those pieces from the kidney. In the case, though, of patients who have particularly large or complex stones, we treat those patients with a procedure called percutaneous stone removal. And this now becomes a little bit more invasive because we're treating larger and more complex stones. And we actually make a small incision. It's about a half-inch incision. We make it in the patient's back, just below their rib cage, which is right overlying where their kidney is. And through that incision, we pass a small camera into the kidney. We break up the stones with several devices that we use, and then we actually vacuum out all of that material from the kidney. So when a patient undergoes this approach, they actually don't have to pass any stone material at all because we remove it all at the time of surgery. The patient typically will spend an overnight stay in the hospital with us. In some cases, though, the patient may even go home the same day, and the incision is closed with stitches that will dissolve or closed with just a simple dressing. Patients generally have a recovery for all of these procedures in the course of about a one to two week. So we'd say that about two weeks after their surgical procedure, the patient should be back doing everything they were doing beforehand. In most cases, it's even sooner than that. Once you've had one kidney stone, you're at increased risk for having another kidney stone. Depending on the study that you read, the risk could be as low as 20% risk of lifetime recurrence up to as high as 50% risk of lifetime recurrence. And so those numbers are quite high, and as physicians, we really don't like to see our patients at that high risk for another stone event in their lifetime. So our goal is to try to reduce that high risk down to something that we would consider to be more manageable or more acceptable. And our goal, we can never get the risk to 0%. Our goal is to get the risk down to the population's risk, which we'd say is about 10%. One in 10 Americans will be at risk for a kidney stone in their lifetime. And the way we do that is we take a very personalized approach as we investigate the reasons why that patient may be forming their kidney stone and what we can do to try to reduce or modify their risk factors. And these are based on things like blood work, but also 24-hour urine metabolic studies where we look at what the patient's metabolic profile is and would they benefit from a dietary change, from the addition of a medication, or some other intervention to reduce their risk.